hey, hey, it's so nice to see everyone again virtually. Hurrah, I am here. Uh, in virtual person, ha <laughs> ha. You're on session, session season three. <laughs> oh no. Oh, music and chat with Shirley Ong and it's a good morning from me to you in sunny Singapore. Please say hi in the live chat. Let us know where you're tuning from and don't be backward and coming forward. Uh, I hope you can hear me clearly. It's always final adjustments for every live stream. Somehow the gremlins get in there and they twiddle with uh, whatever it is that they twiddle with and all the adjustments are never the same. But, um, I want to give you a reminder to put any questions you may have in the live chat so that I may address them as the stream moves along. My usual spiel, you know all about that. And uh, please help me boost my subscriber numbers. Uh, I'd like to reach 600 mm, by November. That would be good. Anytime soon now. <laughs> I want to say uh, hi to my friends. Always oh, nice to see my friends. Uh, I want to say thanks to Gary Mayulo, uh, the ambassador for music and chat, uh, who promptly came to my assistance with, please stand by folks. Yes, uh, I will stall slightly. And uh, it's nice to see uh, Brian. Hey, Brian. Very cool too. And Ben, my dear friend Ben, tuning in from Singapore. Oh, thanks, Ben. Thanks for your appreciation as always. And Ben, you do your own streaming as well. So uh, it means a lot to me that you say this. Who else is there? Oh, hi, Mike Flevin. Good day to you too. Anybody else want to say hello? Well, you know where to do that in the live chat. And oh, it rhymes. I'm always listening out for rhymes or rhyming sentences, statements, phrases. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Okie dokie. Anyway, uh, because we have our esteemed guest today, Craig Enderton who is willing to take uh, plenty of questions. Oh, within reason, sorry, my light source just went off. So one second, please. I think it could be a bulb situation. Well, there you go, tech gremlin. <laughs> it's okay. So uh, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, put your questions in the live chat, please. <laughs> I tell you what, speaking of tech gremlin and MIDI, I've had an issue with my pitch bend wheel as well, but I hope it will behave for me well today. But I think it needs a little cleaning uh, so that it will go back to its zero point successfully each time I use it. Anyway, those of you MIDI controller, keyboard controller people will know what I mean. It needs to go back to z default to zero, otherwise you'd be constantly out of tune. Ah. Okie dokie. So speaking of out of tune, <laughs> let me play you something. Uh, and you guys know that I perform live for you. So, um, and I don't have a sound engineer and all the other tech support guys you usually find in a live concert. But I persevere just for you. All right, so I'm going to play a free song, a movement from a large format piece that I've been <laughs> threatening to record. I hope I'll do that soon. I'm planning, I'm planning, I'm working on the finale movement. Um, wondering if I should uh, non fungible token it the final movement or whether I should record, put it on YouTube, you know, do a video performance pre-actual recording. Mm, let me know your thoughts. Uh, okay, dokes. So let me turn uh, my theremin and keyboard cam on. One second, please. 
here we are. Uh, also, let me tune my theremin quickly.
So, that's free song for you guys. You've seen me uh, play it several times now. Um, and each time I think, should I change something? But I really enjoy the piece as written, so there you go. Oh, thanks, um, Ben. Aww. Oh, <laughs> Mike Clevin. I'm glad your cats love the theremin. So do I. Uh, oh, and Brian, oh, thank you. Uh, you guys are, are really, uh, nice about your compliments, and I, I know you've seen me play several times now, so thank you, t uh, and continue to heap them on, please. <laughs> okay, so, uh... Uh, a little uh, of behind the scenes of when I perform on the live stream since we've been talking about it. Uh, I do use the Triton, this keyboard that you've seen uh, when I live stream in Singapore. I use it as a MIDI controller. I don't actually use the sounds uh, on, it, on it uh, in the library, so to speak. I use it just so that I can send MIDI messages. And I apply a few basic tricks to showcase the performance, such as initiating aftertouch vibrato, which you saw me do, uh, and pitch bending, changing patches via the controller keys, uh, which I did with my X key here, which you also saw in the performance. In essence, I'm exploiting MIDI's language protocol to deliver a smashing show, <clears throat> whilst also making my luggage lighter when I tour. Um, there's a lot of work to assemble the bits and pieces that you need to do it, but it is jolly fun. <laughs> so speaking of MIDI, our next guest, uh, Craig Anderton, uh, the man of mystery, <laughs> the author, the equipment designer, and president of the MIDI Association is here with us in round two today. And of course, we have questions about MIDI for his thoughtful insight. So I'd like to invite Craig in via Skype. Let's do it. Hey, Craig. Hey. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you okay. Uh, just let me check your levels once more. Uh, you might have to turn the volume of your other feet down somewhat. I'm hearing a delayed um, feed. Okay. There we go. How about this? Let's see. That sounds good. Okay, good. Hey, I was thinking about that theremin. You could probably drive auto-tune insane by just putting a theremin track in there. Yeah, I've tried that. Uh, so I tried that and the end result is this. The conclusion for me was this. Do you want to play, make the theremin sound good? Or do you want just to do crazy things with the auto-tune? So, <laughs> you know, the way the theremin is, right? Everyone has this preconception as to what it can or can't do. I've even had people ask me, can the can the theremin play jazz? It can do anything. <laughs> yeah. And uh, again, we talked earlier about not offending people, right? But so I had to not start laughing at them, but politely say, well, you know, it depends on the performer because it's the performer that plays the jazz and not the instrument. And they go, yeah. oh, that's true. <laughs> so, Craig, good to have yes. you back with us again. Um, we last chatted about the DIY culture uh, and music of the 60s and 80s, amongst other things. Uh, today, as you know, we'd like to chat about MIDI a little bit and have you respond also to some of the remarks you made in round one. 
But before I do, I want to send across to the live stream some hellos from around the world, so to speak, from my friends who are tuning in. Ben from Singapore. Hi, Craig from Singapore. Uh, he runs the electronic uh, music lab at the National University of Singapore. So that's Ben saying hello. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Uh, we have That's Mike good... Flavin tuning in from, uh, I believe you're in Pennsylvania, aren't you, Mike? <laughs> Who said, hello, Craig. Hi there, Mike. And we have Sean Geist. I don't know if that's his uh, YouTube moniker or whether that's his real name. I suspect Sean is his first name, but Geist, I'm not too sure. He says, thanks so much for being here, Craig. Sean, let us know where you're tuning in from. And we have Herschel Stinson also saying hi to Craig. Herschel, let us know where you're tuning in from. And we have a friend of ours, Ben and mine, James Wu, saying hello, Craig. Woohoo, Craig. Well, hello to everybody. This is, good. This is great. I, I like doing these things anyway. It's fun to hang out with you, even if it is virtually. But when you're in Nashville, if you need a if you need a lead guitar on your uh, piano parts there, <laughs> on your keyboards, we can do it. <laughs> there you go. I keep on forgetting you're in Nashville. I don't know why. Because when I'm back in Nashville, I try to catch up with friends, but I've never actually caught up with you in Nashville. <laughs> well, I keep a, I keep a low profile. Well, there you go. <laughs> So do a lot of people I know. So um, the MIDI, the uh, Musical Instrument Digital Interface slash protocol arrived in 85 and revolutionized music making and beyond. It gave us 16 MIDI channels, eight bit words of performance information with pitch band getting the special 14 bits. Uh, oh, we also got 128 continuous controllers to handle almost any nuance for an expressive performance. Equipment designers dreamt big with MIDI, exploiting this uh, control protocol in even in non-musical applications. Most and of it us... Controls, it controls the fountains at the Bellagio in Las Vegas. There you go. A lot of people know. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. There you go. MIDI has been a great... I wouldn't say servant because people have the wrong idea. Associate. How's right. that? Assistant. Friend. Friend. A great associate. has Midi has been a great associate in our lives. Um, and the sky's been the limit with equipment designers, especially when uh, Midi allows equipment um, with uh, that are MIDI enabled to talk to each other with the same language. There's no, the, you don't have to worry about l jargon or lingo or slang or accent. They all understand each other. So G Craig, my first question to you is of course, decades later, thanks to sophisticated equipment design, we don't need to know or care about MIDI anymore. It's, you know, it's, it's, behind the scenes so much that we don't have to think about it, leading many to call MIDI a synthesizer they, because that's what they think it is when, when uh, someone in electronic music is asked, uh, do you use MIDI? They'll say, oh, uh, the synthesizer. So does that perturb you to discover this? Uh, first of all, that it's been relegated to being a synthesizer and that it's also so much behind the scenes that we don't have to discuss MIDI anymore or even learn hexadecimal, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Well, I mean, it's been around for so long. A lot of people using it today um, were born after, I mean, they've never known a world without MIDI. You know, it would be like if you were a guitar player and all of a sudden you got excited about jacks on amplifiers, mm. you know, they're just plug into the jack on the amplifier. You know, and you can debate, oh, I like the Switchcraft ones better. But, you know, um, what people don't realize is, is, yeah, I mean, you're right. There's an awful lot going on behind the scenes with MIDI. Uh, it's used in automation. It's used in recording and lighting and live performance, um, you know, all that stuff. But it has become so transparent. That, to me, is, is a testimony to its success, you know. And the other thing is that um, I also think it's important to remember that MIDI was the result 
of a whole bunch of competing manufacturers getting together mm -hmm. and deciding to do something for the common good. I mean, they knew they were going to sell more equipment because of it, obviously. They, mm -hmm. they weren't doing it because they were going to kill their business. But they also knew that the only way it would work is if they all got together, decided on something, had something they, they could all agree on and would, in fact, become a standard. So that's one of the reasons why it has survived this long. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's it's a standard. It's it's just taken over, yeah. and the same process has now happened with MIDI 2.0. It's still a bunch of manufacturers getting together, saying, "What what can we do to make MIDI better? What can we do to, to launch another generation that accommodates what's happening in the future, as well as what you know the advances we know today? Computers are faster, transports are faster. Um, we're not limited to a cable, you know, at modem speeds anymore, or slow modem speeds." So that opens up a huge amount of possibilities, you, just huge. Do you think that we need to get back to the ba to basics with MIDI then in schools? So I guess my question was, you know, are you perturbed about the fact that most electronic music users or students of don't actually know what MIDI is and calling it a synthesizer? Well, I think that, um, again, that's a testimony to its success. You don't have to think about uh, programming things anymore to make controllers work. You have things like MIDI Learn. It used to be that you'd have to say, oh, what's the, what's the hexadecimal equivalent for this controller? And how can I get the filter to think the same thing that the controller's sending? And, you know, all that. And that's really been kind of dealt with over the years. So, so you, you don't think there's a place for MIDI in the school curriculum? Or maybe we oh, should just touch a little bit on it? I think that, well, actually, I'm, I mean, I'm really very much involved in that whole process. We have a whole, uh, we have people at the MIDI Association working on an educational initiative. Uh, I think the, the important thing to consider is that when MIDI 2.0 happens, mm. and well, actually it already happened, but when it actually gets out into the world in large quantities, yes. people are going to have to learn about that. When they learn about that, they're going to learn about all the things that led up to it, because that's all a part of it. Okay. That said... It's still, MIDI 2.0 is has been designed to be even more transparent and more user-friendly. Mm -hmm. So the way that they're going to know it's MIDI is they're going to see the logo on the side of the keyboard or whatever, you know? But that's the whole goal of it. I mean, the whole goal of MIDI is to just be a transparent part of music making. That's an interesting point. Thanks, Greg. So three decades later, we get 2.0, uh, which was January last year, if I'm not wrong. You are correct. Yes, I got something right. You, you know your MIDI history. I know my MIDI. Your history. <laughs> and it comes with 32-bit uh, resolution instead, uh, 256 channels because we have the 16 plus the virtual. Uh, it's bi-directional. Uh, its other features include property exchange, jitter reduction, potential retrofitting on 1.0 devices, and then mini, uh, MIDI message uh, spaces reserved for future new MIDI messages. Uh, well, let's, <laughs> let's talk about the two most important things. Yes. <clears throat> when you say bi-directional, uh, up until now, MIDI has been, it broadcasts data from one piece of equipment to another. MIDI 2.0 is now a dialogue. And when you think, the reason why that's important is Suppose you went out and bought a hardware controller for your DAW with faders and, and knobs and things like that. The way it is now, you have to hope that your DAW has a template that accommodates it. You have to hope that it doesn't change. You have to hope that the controller doesn't change, that there aren't different functions, that you don't go to a new rev of software, all these different things. Mm -hmm. And you also have no guarantee that it's going to control in Cubase what it's going to control in Studio One, which is going to what it's controls and Pro Tools, because they don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. They don't, they just don't talk. Um, with MIDI 2.0, the controller can say, hey, who are you? And the dog can say, oh, I'm Studio One. And it goes, oh, okay, cool. And now all your stuff is laid out mm -hmm. because it has absorbed what the Studio One parameters are, knows where the faders are, knows where the pan pots are, knows where the EQs are, knows all this stuff. And then it can make all its assignments, so you don't even have to think about it any further. Now, I mean, this even goes so far as um, it can ask for the capability. This is called MIDI CI, Capability Inquiry. And what that means is one piece of MIDI gear can ask another piece of gear, okay, who are you? What do you do? 
what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a keyboard controller. Oh, okay, cool. I'm a guitar. Okay, I'm a drum machine. You know, whatever. It can find out about that and, and react accordingly. Um, but even more than that, it can go to the synthesizer and say, hey, so like, tell me your programs and give me your parameters. Throw them up on the screen and you don't need an editor librarian anymore because all the stuff is right there. Mm. Because the synthesizer said, oh, you know what I'm talking about. Well, here's all my presets. Mm. You know, I think that that's a, that's a really, that's a huge significant thing. Mm. And it has implications that go way beyond you know, simple things like that. As a matter of fact, one of the other one of the other aspects of this communications is that if the MIDI 2.0 gear talks to a synthesizer and say, hey, tell me about yourself and doesn't hear anything back and says, hello, are you there? Doesn't hear anything back. It goes, oh, OK, you're MIDI 1.0. And then it speaks MIDI 1.0. That's why it's backward compatible. Mm -hmm. When people first started talking about MIDI 2.0 and saying, oh, yeah, it's going to be backward compatible. The general reaction on forums and things like that was, yeah, right, like everything else was going to be backward compatible, you know. But the difference is that with MIDI 2.0, it's a language. It's not a piece of hardware. So it's like if I go out and I learn Russian tomorrow, it doesn't mean I've forgotten how to speak English. You know, it just means that now I can talk Russian with Russians in their native language. But if I need to speak English with Americans, I can do that, too. You know, either way. And MIDI 2.0 is the same way. If it wants it, if you want to talk MIDI 1.0. It'll talk MIDI 1.0. If you want to talk MIDI 2.0 and get all the extra features and all the extra capabilities, then they can do that as well. So that's why, um, and I think that's particularly important because MIDI 2.0, I mean, we live in an instant gratification society. Everything, you know, people think, oh, MIDI 2.0, that means that tomorrow I'll be able to do all these fabulous things. Well, MIDI 1.0, look how long it took for MIDI 1.0 to roll out. Mm -hmm. It's still undergoing changes. Mm -hmm. You know, this is 40 years, 35, 40 years later. It's still doing changes. Um, a lot of protocols have been added over the years. MIDI 2.0 is designed to have the same long lifespan. Mm -hmm. So equipment will roll out over time. And so you can't tell people, oh, throw away your MIDI 1.0 gear. It has to do everything that it does now. Otherwise, you know, that way somebody can have, if you have a perfectly wonderful setup, MIDI setup right now, mm -hmm. great, you're fine. And then if you find a keyboard controller that really appeals to you because it has, like you said, more resolution and all that, mm -hmm. then you can add that to your setup. And it will still be able to talk to your MIDI 1.0 things. It will be able to talk to any new gear that you get. It will be able to talk to software updates in your DAWs and all that. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why it took so many years for MIDI 2.0 to come out because there were several proposals on the table that did not have the same degree of backward compatibility. But the people who put together MIDI said, no, we can't leave anybody behind mm -hmm. with MIDI. We have to be able to be part of this new world and be part of the new world as well. And that took a lot of effort. And as a matter of fact, um, a lot of MIDI 1.0 gear um, can acquire MIDI 2.0 functions. I saw one lift, somebody lift all the parameters from a DX7 into their computer and play with them. Wow. You know, and that's about as old as you can get when it comes to MIDI. Yeah. And the jitter reduction, thing, as you mentioned, can be applied to MIDI 1.0 gear. Whether they retrofit it or not, I mean, who knows? But mm. uh, capability is there. So you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, instead of a master-slave situation, you have a true co-worker situation with the Absolutely. bi-directional ability, capability. Uh, and also you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong again, that existing MIDI interfaces or MIDI hardware can remain. It's just the that the uh, protocol will be updated from 1.0 to 2.0. It depends. Mm. It depends. I mean, there's some. I mean, some things may not have the hardware to do it. Um, mm -hmm. Like if, if you're dealing with a with a MIDI interface. Although actually, there have been the first the first. Uh, a, the first necessary aspect of having a transport was USB. Mm -hmm. MIDI had to communicate bi-directionally over USB. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be like things like ADB are in, are in the equation, okay. you know, and, and probably Dante and things like that. Okay. So there's not a lot of reason to say, hey, let's try to force 40 times more data down a 31 kilobaud <laughs> port with five pins. And although, in theory, you can, and there are some things that are being done to allow MIDI to be transported over that, over that transport. Mm -hmm. Whether it catches on, how important it's considered to be, whether people actually want it, whether it's worth it for companies to do, that's a whole other topic. However, 
things like the bone box. You know, the bone box is this MIDI translator box. It's like really genius. Mm -hmm. And basically, you can sort of plug anything into it and you can get anything out of it. If you have uh, an ancient MIDI controller in one room and you want to connect via, you know, wireless Wi-Fi to another MIDI the device in another room, you can do it with the bone box, you know, so there'll be translators, there'll be converters, there'll be those kinds of things. Uh, I got a couple of questions already from the viewers. I will send across the first one I see. Uh, it's from Ben because it's uh, in reference to 2.0. Uh, does this mean there could be kits to give some 2.0 capability to 1.0 gear, like the kits which connect CV gear to MIDI? Uh, it's, it all depends. I mean, it's, it depends upon the functionality. A lot of it's software based. So it would require a software or a firmware change. Now, if a piece of hardware has used up all of its available ROM and it's from 1987 and you can't even get those chips anymore, I think you're going to have a hard time putting more memory in there and making it do things, you know, on the other hand, companies have gotten a lot hipper about this kind of thing. Like the Helix, you know, the line six Helix mm -hmm. that was introduced in 2015. And people were saying, why would I buy a multi-effects that's $1,500? That's really expensive. Mm. But the thing is, they over-designed it. They put so much memory in there that they've been able to update it continuously through the years. And I know that there are keyboards out there that have space in them, too. Whether it was done for MIDI 2.0 or not, it was like, as memory got cheaper, mm. you could, well, should we put in one gig or should we put in like 10? Ah, 10, what the heck, you know? Um, yeah, people will be willing to pay another $50. So, um it, again, it, 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 it all depends. We'll have to see how it shakes out. But I think that, for example, um, it wouldn't surprise me if when MIDI 1.0 first came out, there were a lot of little cottage industries coming up with patches and presets and things like that. Or yeah. Well, that's how that's how Digi did, that's how that's uh, Avid got started. Pro Tools got started was the Digidrums EEPROM replacements for the Drumulator. You know, that turned into Pro Tools eventually. So it wouldn't surprise me if someone who was like a huge vintage synth fanatic came up with a retrofit kit for a Lindrum or something that would make it, that would introduce the timing jitter improvements or whatever. I mean, it's, the sky's the limit kind of, we don't know where it's mm -hmm. going to go. That's the whole kind of, that's kind of the whole point of the spec. It's like the tools are there, the openings are there, the options are there. Mm -hmm. If you can take care of it, if you can deal with it, if you want to do something with it, fine, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and there's already, I mean, if you think about it, there's already been kind of a preview of MIDI 2.0, which is the whole MPE thing. Mm. You know, so with MPE, you've got things like Roger Lin's instrument, which is like so cool. You know, you've got a lot of MPE stuff out there. Mm -hmm. And um, now DAWs are starting to add MPE capabilities, right? They never had it before, but they're adding that. So there's no reason why they can't add higher resolution. Um, like Studio One, for example, they, um, they don't use standard MIDI inside the program. It's converted to a higher resolution thing, and they express MIDI data as, a, as percentages of stuff. The Panasonic DA7 mixer, it interpolated the MIDI data coming in. So even though there were only 128 MIDI steps of controller data for the faders, yeah. the faders were responding to 1,024 steps. So, you know, it's, it, 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 it's, it's up to whatever people want to do with it, really. It's quite... You know, it's like it's like giving people a palette of paints that's just filled with all kinds of stuff. It's like, well, are you going to paint a sun? I don't know. There's yellow on there. Maybe, <laughs> you know. That's an interesting point. I remember when we used to have 16 colors only. <laughs> I remember when it was grayscale. I'm a lot older. <laughs> I'm trying not to date myself. <laughs> Uh, we have a question along the similar lines uh, from Chip McDonald. I don't know if you you feel Chip, you can. I love you. Yeah, Chip's I, awesome. Yeah, I don't know if you want to add on to what you've said already, but uh, Chip wants to know, uh, will anyone be making an ASIC to handle 2.0 or will the manufacturers have to develop their own I.O. solution? That I do not know. Um, I'm, I may be president of the Mini Association, <laughs> I do not know how the code works or the, you know, all that stuff. I'm, I'm the person who's supposed to translate it into real world concepts. But Chip, um, God, what an appropriate name to ask that question. I will say that. Uh, there's no chip shortage there, right? <laughs> Where's the uh, laughter? Where's my, I don't have a laughter. Um, I have an applause. 
<laughs> well, it wasn't fun. But, well, okay. but, but anyway, um, I don't know if there will be standardized chips that come out. I really don't. It wouldn't. I mean, if you think about it for a second, there was when when there were chips that came out for things like MLAN and yes. and, and I remember MLAN. Like, I bought the uh, Yamaha O1X. Yeah, and you can think about um, the Jet PLL stuff that that so many companies used for their converters. Uh, you know, TC Electronic and Alesis and all those people. Um, so it's entirely possible that some company will go, hey, you know, let's do, or SSM with their analog chips. You know, they came, they did filters that were used in Korg and Dave Smith and Oberheim and everything else. So I think it was, I think it was, no, Oberheim may have been Curtis. But anyway, you get the point. They're, they're chip manufacturers who see a need and want to make money, and there they go. Thanks, Chip. Uh, I don't know Chip personally, but obviously you do. But thanks, Chip. Chip is smart. Chip is <laughs> Chip, Chip's okay in my book. He lives in Atlanta, assuming this is the same Chip McCall. Atlanta? Chip, let us know if you're the same Chip uh, who lives and works in Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia, I suppose. But And I hope this... I hope I hope the people outside his studio with the leaf blowers have stopped and that the band next door has stopped rehearsing or gotten better. Either one would be okay. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so, uh, Craig, from our first live stream, you mentioned so this is about 2.0 uh, that some famous musician had said to you, "I'll believe it when I see it." About 2.0. Mm -hmm. uh, what weren't they believing? <laughs> some people are professional cynics. This is somebody with like a YouTube channel and lots of following, and you know that if you say outrageous things, you know, oh, um, yeah. people get more clicks. And I mean, that's even improving now with the whole Facebook thing. So saying something like that is like, I mean, look, MIDI 2.0 is a long time coming. I mean, it really was. People have been clamoring it for for years, and um, it's you know, it just take it takes time. The MIDI, you know, the MIDI Association is a completely volunteer organization. Mm. You know, no, one's, no one's paid. I mean, I'm not paid to be the president or anything. Mm. And uh, no one's paid money to do stuff. Yeah. Um, so it's time available. We have people from Microsoft. We've had people from Apple and Google. You know, and they're all putting their two cents in about how to make this thing work. Yeah. And you kind of have to get everybody's opinion because someone from Google is going to come up with a different thought than someone from Apple, you know, or someone from you know, a sequential or from Yamaha or whatever, they all have. And so we had to put all these things together. So it takes time and it takes time to get it right. And it takes time to try to figure out something that's going to be valid 30 or 40 years from now. Wow. To be able to try to predict the future like that is not easy. So it took a long time to happen. And then when it was announced in January, people thought, oh, well, now I'll just go down and buy MIDI 2.0 gear. But what was announced in January was that all the standards had been specified. The, the, the rules had been ratified. MIDI CI had been accepted. All these companies are like, they now had something they could work with and they could start designing and building things knowing that they would meet the specification. Because you're not going to sit there and build stuff if you know six months from now or nine months from now, no one's able to use it because it doesn't match what they have. Yeah. So the design process has started in earnest. If there had been a NAM show this January, I think you would have seen quite a few announcements. Um, but now, of course, the NAM show is going to be in June, uh, and we'll see what happens there. But um, I know, I mean, companies are working on this, believe me. Companies are working on this, and I can't tell you who because I would be, you know, violating every agreement I have with these people. Of course. But um, why is it to say that it is that no one's sitting around going, oh, yeah, maybe two, maybe someday. That's just, that's not the reaction. The feeling is that once it gets out into the world, it's going to make life a lot easier for people. Mm. It's going to answer a lot of questions. One of the goals, I mean, we talk, you know, you can talk about 32-bit resolution, and that's wonderful and all that. Mm. But one of the goals is to have a more analog feel with everything. Not, you know, you'll never experience stair-stepping. You know, when, when you turn the filter on a Moog Voyager, it's, you know, it's infinite in terms of its resolution. When you turn the filter on a, you know, $200 synthesizer, you, you can hear that it's not continuous. It's not an infinite series of points, you know. But with MIDI 2.0, there's a very convincing uh, video demo on MIDI.org that showed two faders being controlled, one by MIDI 2.0 with the higher resolution, one by MIDI 1.0. And it was, I mean, you could see it. One fader was going like this, and one fader was going like this. You know, it was just like, okay. And so you're, maybe, hey, maybe once you get your pitch bend wheel oiled, it'll be able to get more uh, resolution on that too. 
I need to clean my pitch bend wheel. It's not uh, going back to a zero point anymore, but then it's really old, so maybe it's... Maybe the spring. Sorry? Maybe, maybe you should tighten the spring a little bit. Maybe there's a spring that needs to be tightened or, yeah. or maybe, a, you know, but it could also, it may just need a little lubrication, but, you yeah. know, don't squirt WD-40 in it. Use something like the, uh, the silicon thing that they use for locks, you know, graphite oh, or whatever. Yeah, good idea. Thanks. Yeah. You don't want yeah, you don't want to get spray in there. No. And also the weather in Singapore plays havoc on electronics. I And I don't mm. air condition my room, so there's a lot of dust and there's a lot of humidity and we're near the sea, so there's a lot of salt, oh. you know. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, one of the weirdest problems I ever had was with an OB-8. Oh. And uh, it stopped working and I was looking at it and it was like, I, I couldn't, I, I finally realized what was going on. Yeah the pins on the IC and the pins in the socket, the receptacles in the socket were dissimilar metals and crystals had grown between the pins and the socket and was actually shorting it out. Eesh. And the fix was to take a toothbrush and just brush along the side, got rid of the crystals and worked wow. perfectly. Wow, there you go. So uh, one of the statements you made as well, and I know you don't have a crystal ball and you just mentioned that, that who knows what the future is going to have and or the f who and who knows how musicians will use beyond musician, uh, musicians and users of the MIDI protocol. We don't know what they'll be asking the language protocol to do, but you did say the 2.0 spec is as deep as 1.0 was in 83, so I'm quoting you. Some commands are for things that don't exist yet. Have you considered maybe one of this possible command? Or maybe you as a musician, what would you like MIDI 2.0 to give you? Well, I think that the, I mean, the main point that I was making, there's a lot of room for expansion. And there's an understanding, I mean, when this when the specification was developed, there was an understanding that there would be three-dimensional controllers, there would be virtual reality things, there would be mm -hmm. air controllers, different things. You needed to be able to express motions in more than just on-off switches like keys, you know, or, or even aftertouch or things like that. Yeah. So, there's a, so there's room for that kind of thing. Now, what that means is that as manufacturers come up with these products, like if they say, oh, you know, uh, Oculus comes up with some amazing MIDI-based virtual reality controller thing. Yeah. Um, then they go to the MIDI Association and they say, hey, here's what we really need. We really need to have these controllers set aside for this purpose with this resolution doing these things. And then once that's set in stone, then everybody else who wants to do something similar can do it because now there's a standard. You know, so if I say, oh, I'd like to see, you know, flying guitars or something like that, mm. uh, it's it's irrelevant at the moment. Mm. You know, it depends on what the market wants and what mm. the market demands and how the technology improves. The idea of when Bob Moog was trying to do three dimensional keyboards, it was very, very challenging. Mm. The material science wasn't there. Something like Roger Lin's instrument required advances in sensors before he could actually create the kind of instrument he wanted to create. Mm -hmm. But once those sensors became available, all of a sudden, things like MPE became practical. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I mean, in a cliched way, it's a chicken and egg situation. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, we don't even know what kind of bird is laying the egg. So mm -hmm. we'll see what happens, you know? I mean, if there's one thing I'd like to see, I'd like, <clears throat> I mean, the thing that really interests me the most is not having to set stuff up. I mean, that's oh, yeah, good. that would be nice, yeah, wouldn't it? Just not having to set stuff up, uh. you know, and and having one one of well, okay, I'll tell you one thing that I would like to see, and this is maybe a little a little off the wall, but I'd love to see a very large synthesizer controller with tons of switches, tons of buttons, LCDs with what they are and everything, mm -hmm. like an like like the most badass analog synthesizer you ever saw, mm -hmm. you know. And have that be a MIDI 2.0 thing and only speak to virtual instruments. Wow. You know, and then there, there's another thing called um, profile exchange. Mm -hmm. And the, the really simple version of this is consider a drawbar organ. <clears throat> drawbar organs have been immensely popular. Casio keyboards, Arranger keyboards, Chord, Yamaha, 
none of them really use the same controllers to control the draw bars. Mm. So like you might create a sequence where you control the draw bars the way you want them on a Yamaha and then you hook up a cord and now all of a sudden you're like doing completely different things. Yeah. So one of the things about a profile exchange is that you can say, okay, MIDI, the MIDI 2.0 controller can say, hey, what are you? And the, it says, oh, I'm a, I'm a draw bar organ. And it goes, oh, okay, cool. And now all your faders are set up in the way you're used to having it set up. And with a MIDI guitar, it would be, what are you? Oh, I'm a MIDI guitar. Oh, cool. You got, you have six strings or seven or 12. What do you got? I got six strings. Oh, well, that's easy. You know, and now all of a sudden your synthesizer has arranged itself into six monophonic voices with legato defaulted to turn on and mm -hmm. one note per string. You know, and I didn't have to do any of that. That to me is, I mean, that's, that's great. <laughs> I'm ready. Ooh. When will that be out? Next year? Uh, tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow, yes. <laughs> In the beta. No. No, I mean, who knows? Who knows? I mean, really, who knows? Um, I mean, one of the things about uh, MIDI, you know, MIDI guitar to me is fraught. I can play keyboards better than I can play MIDI guitar, <laughs> you know, because it's so... Um, and, and besides, you have all these keyboard players trying to sound like guitar players and all these guitar players wanting to play MIDI. It's like, this doesn't make sense. You know, use your muscle memory. So, um, but what I could see is a controller that is guitar-like and uses mm. guitar-like muscle memory. Mm. In, in a way, the, the Linstrument is kind of like a cross between a Chapman stick, a piano, and a guitar. It's got strings laid out like a Chapman stick and like a guitar, but you play it percussively like a piano or whatever so i can see more instruments like that where you don't have to give up everything you know mm. you know to be able to play a new kind of controller now of course roly tried with the seaboard and that was kind of a difficult that was kind of a difficult thing to master you know that was a very difficult thing to master but again these are early days mm. you know i mean it's it's any, anything's possible I've, i find the instrument a very friendly instrument to play mm. and i find um you know, there's a lot of there, there's some really good iPad instruments, too, you know, like like GeoShred. GeoShred is an amazing, amazing, amazing instrument, mm -hmm. you know, and that ex so far that exists only on an iPad in the in the virtual world. Mm -hmm. But there's no reason why MIDI 2.0 controllers couldn't do what that's doing. In fact, their kind of MPE is already pretty much there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Gotcha. So we have a question from Sean Geist. Uh, he's got. He put in the live chat three different separate comments. So let me just read through it quickly to see which one, which part of it is actually the question. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, here we go. Sean wants to know uh, about your wonderful, wonderful electronic projects for musicians books. Cool. Uh, will there be a second edition because uh, some or most of the components are difficult to get at this point? And uh, where is the third part of this comment? I would think quite a bit could be updated for modern times. Hey, maybe I'll make this question more relevant. Maybe make the projects MIDI capable. Any chance of an updated book forthcoming? That's from Sean. Thank you, he says. Okay. First of all, go to craigandrogen.org and search on update for electronic projects for musicians. And it tells you how you can replace the opto isolators and approved replacement chips and things like that. They're not, the chips aren't pin for pin compatible, but you're not a DIYer if you don't know how to hook up the plus and minus on the op amp to the power supply, right? So, I mean, you know, <laughs> but no, no, you can still, all the things that are in there can still be built pretty much. There are a few exceptions. Um, I don't know how easy it is to get a 565 anymore. And some of the old CMOS switches are a little, are difficult, but not impossible to get. You can still get them. The main problems, the main things that were hard to get are impossible to get. The Clarix Opto Isolator, which is no longer being made, and the Raytheon 4739, which is no longer being made. I'm not sure if the 4136 is being made either, but it has replacements. But there is there's a new op, there's an Opto Isolator made by another company, which is listed in the in the article. That's a that's a re exact replacement for the Clarix, and any dual op amp will substitute for the 4739, and the quality of them is much better now. Anyway, so whether there's going to be an update, I'd like to do an update. I don't have a lab set up right now. I haven't done this kind of thing in years, um, but I've thought about it 
and I thought about it a lot. There's a lot of projects that I have sitting around that never got done, that never got out into the world. I mean, they're finished, they worked. I did a thing called the AMS uh, 100, which was a uh, guitar synthesizer that didn't use synthesis. It was all based on extracting triggers and pulses and things like that and generating control voltages. It was more like a modular synthesizer for guitar so that when you played more notes faster, you could, for example, increase the feedback on a delay line or you know things like that. It responded to your dynamics. Everything was like envelope controlled and followed your playing. And nothing ever happened with that. I've been able to do some of that in software now. But um, currently, my big interest in books is um, if you will allow me a 30 second plug here, I do have three books out that are being published by Sweetwater, Sweetwater Publishing, and they're doing extremely well. I mean, they're really doing extremely well. So I'm <clears throat> focusing on that for a while. I want to get a catalog of quite a few books in there. Um, but yeah, there's. I would love to do another update for Electronic Projects for Musicians, you know? Um, we'll see how long I live <laughs> at this point. <laughs> There you go, everybody. Uh, thanks, uh, Craig, for answering that question. Uh, our friend Mike Flavin reminded us that uh, SynthX uh, and early guitar synth had all these other playing uh, surfaces. You know, they had the guitar, uh, the strings, talking about muscle memory. It had black and white keys. It had buttons as well. So you could basically uh, program uh, program it to do whatever you want, you know, but it was an early MIDI guitar. Uh, mm -hmm. We got to know about it, uh, our viewer and good friend Mike Flevin and I, and those of you who tune in regularly because we had uh, another good friend, Craig, uh, Craig, Chris Carell, <laughs> who uh, mm -hmm. was a Sinclair expert and worked with Michael Jackson on his Bad album. He did a lot of Sinclair sampling work and so and sequencing work for Michael Jackson and then was asked to perform the album live and he thought well I need a guitar synth or something to enable me to trigger all that stuff play all this stuff and do all this stuff uh, trigger the uh, synclavia with the synth X so anyway we were reminded of one of its the early godfathers of guitar synth uh, the synth X in case yeah, our viewers was, uh... are interested it was pretty expensive, as I recall. I think it was—I think it was four thousand dollars or something. And it was like the size of a tuba. It was kind of yeah, ungainly. Yeah, huge. You know, um, there's there was a, a MIDI guitar called U Rock Guitar that was out for a while. It looked like a game controller that had escaped Nintendo Land, <laughs> and and but it was actually quite good. Um, because it, it didn't use strings it it had you know it sensed where your fingers were and you know you, you would hit these like bogus strings to pluck things um and that was actually quite good there was another one called the beetle quantar which uh, was the basis for the g10 or i shouldn't say that it was a, it used the same technology as the g10 which was it used ultrasonics to find out where your finger was on the fret and it tracked pretty well too but again um these were all trying to adapt to a conventional guitar way of thought mm. and guitars you know i don't know where where things went wrong but it used to be the keyboard players were the conservative people <laughs> and they don't roads in the hammond organs and things like then the guitar players were firing their pickups and going through all these different effects somewhere along the line that changed now all the keyboard players went crazy and started doing cool stuff and the guitar players want to sound you know i'm using tubes and a telecaster and that's it you know um so there's been a certain amount of, I think, resistance. Like the G10, the Yamaha G10 actually worked very well, but it drove guitars crazy that all the strings were tuned to G. Oh. You know, so the sound that they heard from the quote guitar unquote was not what they were expecting to hear, and it drove them nuts. To which my answer is wear headphones. You know, but um, uh, you know, there, there, there's, you know, musical instruments. I mean, you, you think about it for a second. I, I'm having to repair the touchscreen on my Korg. M3, okay, the touchscreen, they had to run a bad touchscreen, so I have to, like, replace the touchscreen. I can still buy strings for my 1966 Telecaster. I can still buy pickups for it. It still works, you know? Um, and so there's this, I don't know what I would call it. There's, you know, musicians form a relationship with their instruments. And when you say... You know, it's almost like it's almost like someone who's happily married and someone walks in their life and says, you can't be with that person anymore. Here, take this one. <laughs> well, wait a second. <laughs> you know, maybe I like this other one better, <laughs> you know. Um, and so it, when, when whoever cracks that code of coming up with something that a guitar player can pick up 
Mm-hmm. And within just a couple minutes, they go, yeah, I could, I could, I could get into this. Mm-hmm. There's something that a keyboard player could pick up and go, okay, maybe it doesn't go up and down like what I'm used to, but I'm really having fun with this. Then, then you've, then you've cracked that code, but people are going to, it's, it's difficult to learn a new controller. I mean, it's just, it's just darn difficult. I think this reminds me of our first conversation and how you mentioned that, you know, we really should ask, what if I do this instead of how do I do this? I believe, uh, maybe keyboard players have come to a point where they tired of sitting behind the guitar player and the lead singer <laughs> and they want to explore so that they can have more of a an opportunity to show off what they're doing so whereas with a guitar player well i'm not saying this as a general statement to cover all guitar players i'm saying i think uh, when you play an instrument such as a guitar most most people would want to know what you can play and can you play like so and so you know whereas with the keyboard players the likelihood of being asked that question is less it'll be more like oh what can you play what does this instrument do you know what what sounds do you get from this instrument so the keyboard players will go hold on it's beyond sounds as me too whereas the guitar player will say oh i can play scales on it or i can sound like you know so and so what well, do you I mean, the problem is that, you know, keyboards and drummers are rooted to their positions. Mm-hmm. You know, the guitar player, the singer, and the bass player get to move. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's very difficult to play music without moving around. Mm-hmm. I mean, it really is. So there was an instrument I made once for Martha Davis, you know, who was the singer in the motels. Mm-hmm. And she's still, she's still great. I made her this instrument. It was a clear plastic tube with mercury switches in it. So oh, wow. the notes that she depended upon the angle that you played it and it had a volume control so you could change the level while you were playing it. And visually, it was like really, really cool, you know, because of, you know, um, and then I made another one that was based on light. It had photocells driving oscillators that were, that were like tuned to the same frequency, but as you changed it and as the light changed, they'd go in and out of tune and phase and do interesting things and you could, you could change what they did. So it's kind of like a, in some ways it was like a light operated theremin in a way. Yeah. So there are things like, but imagine like if, keyboard players um there's no reason why keyboard players couldn't have this amazing virtual keyboard rig in front of them that only they could see and they could run from this to that to this other thing and do these amazing sounds and change these amazing things and people would watch them i think it would be fascinating to see somebody do that i I had an interesting conversation with some of the keyboard players from when i played at moke fest in 07 and i asked them you know when they play scales or arpeggios or passages that go across more than two octaves let's say do they use two hands because it looks cooler (laughs) or do they do the classical way you know where you have to do the hand over thumb exchange kind of thing and they laugh because they say well that's interesting, you know, no one's ever really asked us that, but uh, the fact that as a keyboard player, because you're hidden behind your instrument, you can't really get out and and prance around, that having this two-handed exchange looks more interesting. It's the entertainment value if you're playing live. <laughs> well, and the strap on keyboards to me look pretty silly. I've only seen one person really pull it off, you know, oh, yeah. uh, where, it, where, it look, where it looked like, okay, this guy was meant to play this kind of keyboard, oh. I get it, you know. But um, but they, they generally look weird. They have like a bogus neck on them and things like that. Oh. But there's no reason why there couldn't be a controller made that was comfortable for keyboard players mm-hmm. that didn't just look like someone took a keyboard and slapped it in something. Like yeah. it could be it could be something where they could like play something, sustain and tilt it, you know, and, and mm-hmm. move it. Uh, velocity velocity sensors. I mean, that's what we yeah. got in all these phones. Velocity sensors have progressed tremendously. There's no reason why keyboards can't have that. I mean, one of the when Elisus was making a spring reverb Im- imitation, I said, "Why don't you put a battery with a sen- with a mercury switch in there that shoots a voltage into the thing whenever you hit it, so it goes <laughs> like a spring reverb does." You know, why couldn't keyboards do interesting things like that as well? I mean, here you're playing these little 
dinky wheels, you know? Yeah, tell me about it. I love, I tell you, I do love playing the, the keyboard slash synth. You know, I've tried, I do synth lines instead of, and I do some keyboard stuff, but primarily I love playing synth lines and doing all the stuff that MIDI allows me. And I do a lot of aftertouch because I get to move. I can put some weight on right. it, you know, and I'm moving down and up and, oh, what's she doing? <laughs> But I do like my controller to be light because I'm a small person and often than not, I load in and out on my own. And at the end of a, a long day or night of playing, I'm tired and I'm weary. I don't want to be cutting heavy gear out. So I still like the well, portability, that's, but that's the problem I would everybody. like all that bells and whistles like we were talking about. So, Well, you know, things can be... It's very possible that things would be modular in the future, things like you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I when I first started gigging over in Europe, I had to take I took all this gear. I had like an electric spoke coder, I had mixers, I had a, a couple ASRXs next to each other I, that I had to feed, and I mean it was just a pain in the butt. And the last few gigs I did there, I had an adrenaline, ah. my guitar, and a MIDI cable to get from the MPC to the adrenaline to trigger the to trigger the uh, you know sequences yes. and filter change like that mm. and it was great for all this like techno type edm stuff because all the guitar the guitar was always synchronized it was all these these cool rhythmic things and that's all i needed i called it the carry-on concert because it could fit in my carry-on bag you know except for the guitar and for the guitar i had a pv that even delta couldn't destroy so you know i was okay i could put it in the luggage hold yeah, so, so what I've managed to do is I carry my theremin, of course, and all the interfaces in my laptop because I soft synth everything uh, and it's carry on. But at my destination, I then borrow a MIDI controller and microphone mm -hmm. stand, anything, all the hardware that I need, but I do need to borrow a MIDI controller. I look forward to the day where I can actually fold it up. But it, that's, that's but it still have all the bells and whistles. But I like a particular touch, you know, when you play, uh, when you require a, a MIDI controller to allow you to play synth lines as well as keyboard lines. You want that, like a semi-weighted feel for the keyboard lines, mm. but also allow you to play synth without kind of hurting your thumb a lot, you know, because it's so heavy. Right. Yeah. Right. So that's... That will be my dream keyboard controller, I think, whether it's got MIDI 2.0 or not. I think the the um, operational part of the the actual instrument is as important to me as whether it has, you know, 1.0 or 2.0. Anyone out there with similar thoughts, let us know and keep putting your questions in the live chat. Um, I've got some questions for Craig about uh, the future. Um, and it's been interesting reading for me, and also I've had guests talking about immersive audio and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, and and also a guest talking about AI and all that stuff. So, <laughs> so my little spiel to my next question uh, reads like this: uh, When MIDI enabled home studios, recording students mm -hmm. kind of went out of fashion. Not for long. This, you know, they're still around, but it made uh, recording from home possible, and more of us did it. Uh, the latest fashion fear is how machine learning will put us out of jobs. And I just want to make this clear for our viewers out there: um, facial recognition, speech recognition, autonomous car driving, all tasks known as narrow AI. So you don't lump everything under AI and think, oh no, what's going to happen now? Uh, and I remember in the late 90s, I played with Dragon speech recognition. So some narrow AI have been around for decades. It's not just suddenly appeared and it's going to take over the world. So don't misunderstand that. Uh, general AI, of course, is where machines understand and or learn any intellectual task that a human being can. So... Um, I just want to pick up on a music creation service uh, that's been around since 2018, if I'm not wrong, that uses AI algorithms and they call Amper Music. I know there's several out there that do similar things, but they actually allow you to custom make your own 
even as a non-musician and all you have to do is pick genres so let's say country music uh, mood sad uh, the piece will climax at a certain point and if you have a movie clip how long it will be and voila you have you have it um, and then marketing the look, the look and feel of music huh sorry the look and feel of music yeah thank you there you go and then you can add that to the marketing boast which is that you get this much the same result and you don't have to wait on the composer or deal with their whims and most of all it's royalty free <laughs> yeah <laughs> but look at first we, we need to differentiate between ai and, and machine learning they're two different things and machine learning could be incredible for musicians like for example if you comp if you comp vocals and you have a and you have machine learning machine learning can say it can it starts off stupid you know because it doesn't know anything but it watches how you do your comps and it goes oh i see craig always craig picks the ones where the notes are in tune okay and it goes hmm he likes it if a sustained note has vibrato that increases toward the end he seems to like that a lot he seems to like things where the S's aren't too prominent. He seems, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, and it starts learning and starts picking the stuff up more and more. And then at some point, in theory, it would get to the point where I would do my comp and I would say, make your recommendations. And it would say, well, here's the comp that I found that I think is going to please you the most. Save me a huge amount of time. And it would end up making the choices that I made because it learned from the choices that I made. So in that respect, you know, I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, you know, when samplers came out, uh, there was this whole hue and cry about, well, it's going to put musicians out of business, you know. And my reply was always, who do you think plays them, accountants? I mean, you know, it's like. <laughs> oh, did you really <laughs> say that? <laughs> I said that to the young people. But yeah, I, I make friends easily. No, <laughs> but. How, no, to make, how to make friends and then lose them instantly. <laughs> but, there's, but there's another aspect. And, and now, now we're getting off into like a, a tangent, but it's something that I think is important, um, which is what is the purpose of music? Is the purpose of music to become a big star and make money? Is the purpose of music self-discovery? Is the purpose of music to communicate with friends? Is music a language? You know, is it, I mean, what, what, what are we doing music for? If you think about it, I think I may have mentioned this on the last one too, but it's an important point. For 35,000 years, music didn't exist. It was evanescent. It was of that moment and then it was gone. There was no way to preserve it. There was no way to know about it. There's no way to know whether Bach really did put an implied swing in those notes, which a lot of people think. Mm -hmm. They think he wasn't metronomic. They think he wasn't da 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 but more like da 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 You know, it had, had a little more of that. And a lot of a lot of orchestras put that in because they think that's probably the way that it was done, but we don't know, mm -hmm. you know? Only in the past hundred and some odd years have we been able to freeze dry the sound. So now, if a band wants to compete, or if you want to release a record, you're not releasing, you're not competing with the band down the street or the band that was filtered through DJs getting payola on radio stations. You're competing with every piece of music that has ever been recorded because it's all on YouTube or Spotify or something else. Record companies no longer look for the next Prince because mm -hmm. Prince is already there. They don't look for the next micro. I mean, all that stuff is still there. It falls in and out of favor like anything else, but it's all there. So, you know, people are saying like, well, you know, you can't make a living in music. You never could. I mean, back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, people think that people made money off of music. You didn't really. The difference was, in those days, you could have a local following and play live and support yourself. Mm. But having a top 10 record was just as difficult as getting you know, 2 billion streams on Spotify now. Mm. And it was always the top 10% of the label that allowed the other 90% to lose money because the top 10% made so much that the record company could afford to write off that other 90%. So you just, we just need to be realistic about expectations. And people are saying like, oh, I can't make money off CDs anymore. I'm, owed, I'm still owed money from the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. And I'll never collect it. It's over six figures, but I'll never collect it because to get in expert witnesses and investigate the books and go through all that stuff is going to cost more than what I would recover. And they know that. And besides, half of the companies are gone now. So we got to get that fiction out of the way. So why do I make music now? I make music, I make more music than I ever have. I have more fun doing it than I ever have. 
I have my, you know, 1,600 subscribers on YouTube or whatever. I don't promote it. I don't push it. I don't boost posts on Instagram. I don't do any of those games. I just put the stuff out there. If people want it, they can listen to it. If they don't, they don't have to. They can like it. They can not like it. But I'm doing it for me. I'm doing it for my friends. I'm doing it because I love to make music. Every time I listen back to what I've done, I learn more about myself. I do a project every year, and I look back, and it's like, I can see what person I was in 2016 or 2017 or 2018 or 2019 or 2020. And now the 2021 project is another complete change. Mm. You know, I'm in a, just in a different space. And, you know, it used to be, I mean, in Brazil, when you went over to somebody's house, you would bring your, your percussion with you. Mm. You know, you wouldn't sit down and watch football. You know, you'd play music. People played, people played music. And we had troubadours and we had... Uh, people buskers we had that it was a much more personal thing i think the days of like multinational corporations buying up record labels because they think they're going to make money those are those are gone that was a blip you know that was a blip and if you look at the way things are selling if you look at the sales at the itunes store they just keep going down and down and down cd sales down and down people talk about vinyl vinyl is such a niche and 50 percent in the last survey in the uk 50% of the people who had bought vinyl had never played it. They'd never heard it. They bought it because they liked the cover and they wanted to be hip. You know, so music is everywhere. It's been devalued totally. If you can go on Spotify, you can spend your 10 bucks a month and have access to anything you want or on YouTube music or Amazon Prime music. It's all free. It's all there. You know, you know the money is distributed inequitably. It's, it's over as a business model. If you want to make money, be a gamer. You know, if you want to make money, be a gamer, go on YouTube. If you want to make, I mean, if, it, that's what people are paying money to see now. That's what people are, are streaming. Um, is that a bad thing? I'm not sure it is. I think music is very beneficial. I think music is a very important part of feeding your soul. And which is, you know, to me, I'd rather sit down and play guitar for an hour for myself than to sit down with a focus group about what the lyrics should be for my next song to appeal to a demographic from 18 to 24, you know? Thanks, Craig. So you, <laughs> you youngins out there, don't give up your dream, though, because uh, I think for some of these people or the certain groups, they find it kind of cathartic to put their, their words into lyrics and they're able to express themselves via a song or via songs or be a player in a band. I hear so many stories of, of folks telling me, friends telling me, oh, I was a shy kid and I wanted to meet more people or I wanted to nap me a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever. And music helped me do that. And, and they've, uh, uh, cr they've, gone into careers that have to do with uh, music therapy, you know, as you were saying, or, or even translating work uh, because of their ear training, they could pick up languages or nuances in languages and that kind of thing. So the sky, as you say, the sky is the limit. It's also broad and it covers so many areas you can get yourself involved in uh, because of your start in music. <laughs> well, I will, give you, I will give you a positive spin on this too. Okay. Um, Aside from the fact that if you be if you play music, you'll save thousands of dollars in therapy later on, <laughs> uh, pay for your studio a thousand times over. I think the live performance, the one thing you can't get from Spotify and YouTube and Amazon Prime and all that is you cannot get the electricity of a live performance. I agree. You just can't. And um, seeing a video of a live performance is not the same as a live performance. Having an audience together, having people get excited, having sound wash over you. I mean, I, I'll never forget the first time I was doing a seminar for a bunch of kids, and they had never heard a wave file before, and they'd never heard Beethoven. Oh. They'd only heard MP3s. They'd only heard pop music. So I cranked up Beethoven's third, and they were like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, they have never heard anything like that before. They just flipped out. It's like, oh, my God, you know. And so I think that uh, live music, uh, you're going to, as you point out, it is get, it, things are getting a little more portable, a little easier to deal with. But I also think that there's going to be more opportunities for um, playing not necessarily stadiums and raking in huge amounts of money, but playing smaller places playing cafes, being able to keep most of what you make, you know, instead of having to spend a zillion dollars on 14 flatbed trailers cruising around the United States, you know, or something like that. 
if you can scale it down, you can enjoy yourself, and you'll and once more we will have local music scenes because there will be some people who float to the top. It's like, oh, I saw this person at blah blah blah. The other, they are amazing. Just this guy with a guitar doing some looper thing. There's a guy named Johnny A up in Boston, and he's um he's done a lot of stuff. I think he played with the Yardbirds for a while when they did a revival. I mean, he's a session guy. He knows his stuff. Yeah. I saw him doing a live based looping act and it was just him doing loops and playing against it. Um, and it was, it blew my mind. I mean, the guy was just amazing, just amazing. The way he played it, his, first of all, he had incredible command of the guitar and the tone and he had as much command of how to use a looper, which was to actually, he used two of them and he had songs segmented into things. He could switch between oh. stuff. He could improvise. And if he was playing within a, within 300 miles of here, I would drive there. I would. Yeah. It was that good. And if he was playing in Nashville, I'd call everybody I know and say, you got to see this guy. So I think that there's going to be more opportunities like that that will ultimately be more fulfilling because you'll be dealing with real people. It will be more fulfilling for the audience because they'll get to see a real person. So I do think that if we if we play our cards right, mm. live performance can be like the next big thing for music. Mm. Thanks. Anyone else with a point, with a point, or with a comment, or with a question? I'm look up. You can just say I'm an idiot too. I mean, you know, whatever works. I'm sorry, Craig. Or you can just say I'm an idiot. Whatever works. It's. <laughs> No, I don't believe in idiots. Just good ideas. <laughs> hmm. Yes. <laughs> I was actually going to put together a live act for Halloween, but with the whole Delta thing, it kind of fell oh. apart. And it was with a friend of mine, and we were going to call it. Was going to be a, a comedy music thing. We were going to call it the Deadful Great. It was going to be oh. for Halloween, and we sing only rock star, only dead songs by dead rock stars. Oh. That's and fine. part of it would be like imitation voices and some of it would be history and some of it would be like theater. And it, it, would, it would, it just would have been a fun thing. And I bet people would have liked it. Well, I you really know what? That... The next time it's Halloween and I'm in Nashville, let me know and I'll participate in it. You should. You should. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> I do have one last question. Uh, if no one else has a question there. Uh, and I give, you know, I allow everyone a few extra seconds because of the lag. Uh, oh, I do have a question. Our friend Chip just chimed in with, uh, have either of you heard what's on the OpenAI Jukebox website? Have you, Craig? I actually haven't. I I've heard, don't I don't know if I heard I have. That one. I, I've heard a bunch of them. And I know you're talking about OpenAI in the forum there, um, which you should come back to. It's okay. It's safe. Um, but I, the thing is, you can. I've, I've 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 spent a lot of time doing soundtracks for things, and the whole point of a soundtrack is to be able to melt into the background and be of interest, but not be interesting. And I think AI would be just incredible for that. Just incredible. Say, I want this kind of genre and this kind of thing. You know, um, and you know, the question is, how far can machines go? Mm. You know, how far can machines go? I can have something happen to me during the day and a song comes out of it. How can a mach what can a machine have that happens to it that makes it want to come up with something that it's never done before? What connections can it make where it goes, I've never made this connection before and I'm going to produce something mm. of interest? So then it starts getting really interesting. So and I, I have no mm. doubt that it's possible. I see what you mean. It's a very good point. It's a different kind of organic association, uh, which leads to generation. But it may be its own thing, you know. It may be that it may be that a bunch of computers that are networked band together and create a type of music that is uniquely theirs, and that people listen to, and they go, "Humans could never do that," but that's really cool. I like what the I, I like what these things are doing. Yeah, I hear you. Well, I have a final question since we don't have any more and it's getting close to the the hour and I don't want to tire Craig out too much. My question yeah. is, huh? We might, we might ha have you back for another round in the next year to catch up on the latest updates with uh, MIDI 2.0 or, or, you know, any new ideas from equipment 
designers and developers whether there's been you know a, a new production that is particularly worthy of chat etc etc i would definitely recommend going to midi.org midi.org is where all the stuff happens first you can download the spec you can see what's happening with usb i mean all the all the news comes out there new products there and go. there's you know, artist profiles who are using it so if you want to know what's going on and not have to wait till we talk again just go to midi.org Thanks, Craig. So my final question is actually about the work, uh, the work area again. Um, and this is term called micro working, which you might have heard of. Uh, but I read an article uh, on the Guardian by writer Phil Jones, and he suggests that the pandemic has actually moved this work sector along with AI taking over tasks, thanks to their immunity to viruses and as such and micro workers, people from around the world performing many small repetitive tasks employed to assist them in making small adjustments. So the AI would do the actual work and at the very end, if they need to be guided, the human goes and then say, it should go that way. Do you think because the music industry was one of the first to actually transition into tech taking over simplifying tasks and amplifying quantity and quality that we might also be one of the first to be micro worked completely perhaps you know where we don't actually need to do much of the work and such as you're saying with comping if ai could come in and say well we know what craig usually likes we'll just get it done for him and he can come back from dinner and say yeah, okay, just over that one a bit and we're done. But instead of yeah. you alone, we have people, you know, groups of people doing little pushing, finalizing little tasks for AI. Maybe, I mean, who knows? You know, I mean, like an, a really good example of, of, uh, of AI, actually. Um, I don't think the product ever came out commercially, but Adobe did a proof of concept of speech replacement, dialogue replacement. Uh, so for example, let's suppose that let's suppose that I hired James Earl Jones to do the narration for a commercial on canine dog food or something like that. And so, you know, he's expensive as hell and he's great and he comes in and he does this thing, canine dog food, you know, and he's like does this whole thing. And then he takes off to his condo in Tahiti or whatever he does in his spare <laughs> time. And the canine dog food people come to me and they say, ah, oh, man, we're really sorry, but we're changing it to King Rex dog food. So you got to change all the mentions of canine to King Rex, you know, and it's like, you know, budget overruns. How do I get James Rose on? Da, 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 da. Well, what this machine could do or what Voce, I think it was called Voce or Voce or something like that. What it could do was it could search all the phonemes in the spoken words and go, oh, here's k, here's e, and here's ing, and here's er, it, and it put them together and replace canine with King Rex and that kind of thing. Yeah, I could do it. You know, it would take me days. You know? Whereas with a good computer and a program, I mean, it could do it in, you know, you know, a couple minutes and, um, you know, things like that. I'm, I'm anything. I mean, look, I cheat all the time and all music is smoke and mirrors. All video is smoke and mirrors. You know, it's, um, I mean, I remember, I'm old enough to remember when people started using echo on voices and EQ and, and critics were saying like, well, that's just, that's a crutch. You know, if you're using echo on your voice, that's a crutch. You know, and it's like, no, it's like, I just want to sound like I'm in a, in a hall or something like that. And like people, you know, and another thing that one of my favorite, one of my favorite things to complain about is the way people say that pitch correction is a horrible thing. Because the thing is, it's not it's not pitch correction that kills the song. It's the person applying the pitch correction. And I like to point out that pitch correction has made my vocals so much better, not because I go in and fix every note, but because I can sing with complete abandon, not worry about it. Just think about the feel, not worry about whether I'm in tune or whatever. And if I come up with a really good vocal and there's like three or four notes that are out of pitch, I don't have to go, oh, I got to punch it. Or I got to redo it. I can just go. I can fix those four notes, and I manage to keep the vocal. So, is is pitch correction evil or is it good? Well, it depends upon who's applying it. So, when it comes to AI, who's going to write the algorithms? You know, mm -hmm. we already. I mean, if you think of it, it, so much has been, 
this is just a continuation of the industrial age. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, instead of assembling cars on assembly lines, it's assembling data in ways that are meaningful in, in particular ways. But, you know, another thing is that society, who knows, if you look at a past history of pandemics, society is always ripped apart and put back together afterward, both politically and socially. That's, that's just a given. That's just what happens when there's a pandemic, whether it's the plague or whether it's the Spanish flu or whatever. It always has consequences that are deep, lasting and significant. What are these going to be? I don't know. There's, I like the studies in Japan that say that four-day work weeks, people, are more, people produce more in a four-day work week than they do in a five-day work week. And I think there's a Danish study and one in Iceland. There have been quite a few that, have, that, at least to me, show conclusively that by giving people that extra day off where they can relax and they can hang back and recover from the stress and all that, when they actually go back the next week, they want to. They're ready to go. They want to do something. They're full of energy. They're happy. I mean, it makes complete sense to me. So maybe the way work will be done will be different. Maybe, I mean, remote working, sure, cut down on pollution in Los Angeles. You know, yeah. there's no need for huge commercial real estate. There's no need for a lot of these things. There's no need to, I mean, it, it's good from an environmental standpoint. It's good from a psychological standpoint. In a country like the U.S. where the child care situation is pathetic, to be able to, like, know that you can take care of your kids if you have to or take them to the doctor doctor if you need to or whatever you know so who knows where this is all going to go I, I you know I don't know mm -hmm. I you, it's a continuum it could like turn to total crap or it could be like paradise or it'll be like normal human things and just sort of muddle along halfway in between I just don't know I just don't know but I do know people have to listen to music they, they have to listen they have to listen to people if you if you deprive people of being able to listen to music it's a it's a tough thing if you ask anybody well not anybody but a lot, you know, in, in studies about, like, if you had to lose a sense, which would it be? It, hearing is usually the last one, even more than eyesight. There you go. So, I don't know. Thanks, Craig. And with that said about the future and hope and all that, uh, I'd like to thank you for coming back for round two. I look forward to round three, actually. I'll come up with a... <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I might be back in Nashville for round three. There you go. Well, we can, we can hang out together and, and talk and play guitar and keyboards. And theremin. Or, or, or instruments and new controllers. Oh, I mean, who knows? Oh, yeah. But anyway... No, it, it, people should not... You know, don't get discouraged. Don't lose hope. Just do everything you can. You know, just do everything you can. And, you know, people want to make changes in the world. Make a change in yourself first and change your friends. And, you know, it's it's one. It's all one-on-one. -on -one. We're one-on-one. -on -one. Even though it's virtual now, it's still one-on-one. -on -one, really. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I have enjoyed the an hour and a half with you, just chatting with you. And uh, I, as you said, I feel really fortunate that I can do this with my friends and even the friends in the live chat to see them and hear their comments. And I feel like I, I have my own party on a regular basis, you know. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's missing is we can't clink glasses or shake uh, each other's hands or give hugs and stuff, but we're still interacting with each other. So thanks, and that's thanks to technology. <laughs> Well, if you're in Nashville, I'll make you an awesome gin and tonic. All right, I'll remember that. <laughs> so, Craig, uh, thanks. We have totally and utterly enjoyed having you on the live stream, and we hope thank you, you so had much. fun, too. Oh, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. I really want to try to let people know things aren't as bad as it may look sometimes. Yeah, no, everyone I know in the live chat, they're pretty happy. Happy Larry, Sally's. <laughs> they're good people. You guys are okay, right? No one's kind of like hanging their heads down and thinking, oh, no. No, you're not. You're all smiling. I can see that. So anyway, Craig, we wish you exciting projects ahead. If not, continue with exciting projects. And, of course, to stay safe. Um, and a little virtual applause is always good. So everyone, please say bye to Craig. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate it. So, okay, Craig, I'll let you go on Skype. Uh, but thanks again. Take care now, and I'll see you soon, I hope. Take All right, care you take meantime. care. Too. I will. Bye. Bye. -bye. Ah, 
Yeah, there we are. <laughs> anyway, it's been so good to see you all. Uh, people I know, my dear friends and new uh, visitors to the live stream. Thank you all for spending the hour and a half or so with us and Craig. Um, if you haven't subscribed yet, I'm, I would really, truly love to hit my subscriber number of 600 by the end of November, if possible, or even go higher, go beyond 600. Um, I don't put uh, money in marketing and all that stuff, so I let it uh, grow organically, but uh, as a result, um, I'm appealing to the viewers to please subscribe. Thank you very much. Uh, my music is also available on Bandcamp. I think I have a URL there. If you're interested to enjoy more, uh, our next episode um, is with Bruce Woolley. We've had him for round one already. Bruce uh, was a co-writer with Trevor Horn and Jeff Downs on a video, Kill the Radio Star. Most of us know this song. It's become a cult song, um, and it's been covered over almost 200 times, I think, from what we discussed in our first round. Um, but uh, Bruce will be chatting with me about the theremin for round two, and I can't wait um, to talk to him about it. So... Um, Please join us then. Oh, and have a fun Halloween weekend, whether you are trick-or-treating, you are simply relaxing with the Night of the Living Dead, or you're out handing candy. Hmm, anything with chocolate in there? Send them over here. <laughs> but uh, yes, thanks again, uh, everyone. Please uh, share this live stream with your friends please the more the merrier i say i love a hearty party when we get together it uh, makes our guests feel welcomed and it also allows us to have uh, a fun time together in the live uh, chat as well um so okay then uh, uh just a uh an update though bruce will be joining us in three weeks instead of uh, two weeks. You know how I usually broadcast every fortnight, as I call it, every second weekend. But uh, due to a conflict in schedule, Bruce cannot make it till the 20th of November. So please bear that in mind. Um, I, uh, if you subscribe and tap the notification bell, you will know when I make an announcement of the next live stream. So... That's the way to go. Uh, but that also gives you an alert if I change the live stream dates. So if Bruce uh, can make it earlier, I will make that happen. And consecutive guests as well, you would receive alerts to them. So, um, alrighty, uh, you, any one of you have questions for me before I bid you uh, au revoir? Oops, sorry. Anybody with a question? Who's going out trick-or-treating? I guess not. Who's handing out candy? Yeah. 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 Who's gonna chill and watch the Night of the Living Dead? No, yes. Okay, then I will run the outro, uh, but I'll stay on for a while in case you want to chat on the live chat area. Okay, thanks, guys. Uh, take care now. Uh, uh, be safe. Uh, and I'll see you and your friends back for the next episode where we have Bruce Woolley. Okie dokie. Bye.